So last week we talked about God's love for us, especially God's love as a father. We said he's a father. The father, the fatherless, the husband, the widows is our God. He cares for us as a father would care for his children. Today we want to talk about God as our friend. You know, when you came to Jesus and you were born again, your whole life changed. Remember that? You came to him. You said, God, I'm sorry. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I want to serve you now. You be in charge of my life. A prayer, something like that. And you pray that and you meant it. Then you were born again. And stuff changed in your life. Colossians 1, 13 tells us. But he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. You used to be in the domain of darkness. You used to serve the devil. You used to do the things that he liked. And now you've been transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved son. And sometimes when that happens, when we're born again, our lives change so much that we might lose some friends because they become uncomfortable with you. You're no longer the same. You don't laugh at the off-color jokes. You just don't want to do the things you used to do. And they don't really know what to do with you anymore. It happens over and over again. Happened to my husband, lost a whole bunch of friends when he was born again. But that's okay, because he gained the best friend you could possibly have. And that's our Lord Jesus. He is a friend like no other. You might ask yourself today, is it possible to be a friend of God? Well, the Bible tells us that Job and Abraham were friends of God. Let's look at Job chapter 29, starting at verse 1. Job was reminiscing about the time before he went through his trial, the time before Satan attacked him. It was not God, but Satan who attacked him and caused him to lose all of his wealth and his children and put sickness upon him. And now he's sitting there miserable and he's remembering those days. Start at verse one. And Job again took up his discourse and said, on the day that I, on that, oh, that I was, I was in months gone by, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone over my head and by his light, I walked through darkness. As I was in the prime of my days, when the friendship of God was over my tent. He said, the friendship of God was over my tent. Is that possible? Yes. You see, Job was a righteous man. He lived for God. He did the right thing, and God blessed him, and God gave him more than enough, and God could trust him with wealth because he gave to the poor, and he helped other people out. But during this time, when Job was going through all the trouble he was going through, he kind of felt abandoned. He thought, well, God must have left me. He must have left me. I'm alone now, but then he found out God came. God appeared to him. God set his thinking straight. He said, Job, you're looking at it wrong. Job saw that, and he said, I'm sorry, God. I'm going to trust you again, basically, my paraphrase. And when he did that, God changed his life. God restored to him double of everything he'd lost. Let's look at Job 42, verse 16 and 17. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his grandsons four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. You see, the sufferings Job went through, that horrible time was probably no more than a year, probably less than that, the scholars tell us. But afterwards, God blessed him so much and gave him double what he had had. He said, God was my friend. Abraham was also called a friend of God. In James 2, verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Why was Abraham called a friend of God? He simply believed what God told him. God said, you're going to have a son, and through him I'm going to bless the nations of the world. And Abraham believed it. Abraham didn't have any. He had the child that wasn't from his wife, but that wasn't what God meant. He said, I'm going to give you a child through this through your wife who's been barren all of her life. And Abraham simply believed God, and that made him his friend. You see, Abraham had made what the Bible calls a covenant with God. A covenant relationship is simply this. They went through certain rituals, and that meaning of that was all that Abraham had, he gave to God. But all that God had, he gave to Abraham. And they joined their names. God was no longer just God. He was called the God of Abraham. Abraham became the friend of God. So when the time came and God said to Abraham, I want you to offer your only son, Isaac, 
To me, Abraham didn't hesitate. Look at Hebrews eleven nineteen. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Abraham got up the next day. He took Isaac up on that mountain, and he got ready to offer him as a sacrifice, and God sent a ram and said, no, no, I don't want you to kill Isaac. I just wanted to see if you're willing. Abraham proved that he was willing to do anything God wanted. And because Abraham was willing to give his son, God was able to give his son for us later on. You know, God is a jealous friend. You might think, well, that's not very good. No, no. When it comes to God, it is. You see, he wants all of your heart and all of your devotion. And he will not share us with the world. Exodus 34, 14 says, For you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. His very name is Jealous. God does not want us with one foot in the world, doing all the things the devil wants us to do and acting like him, and then coming to church and saying, Hallelujah, I'm in church now. That's good. I'll praise God. But I'm going to go out and do all the things I always did. God says, No, make up your mind. <clears throat> make up your mind. Come in all the way. I want all of you. I want all your devotion. I want all of your heart. James 4, 4 tells us, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You see, we have to choose. Who are you going to serve? How are you going to live? Are you going to be a friend of God? Then go all the way. Some Christians think it's okay. I'll just go part of the way. I'll just do a little bit of what the Bible says, but I'm going to do what I want to do, and nobody's telling me, including God. But God says, "Mm -mm, no, 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 that's not what I want. I want all of you. And if you'll do that, he has so much to give you. You will not be a loser when you follow God. 1 John 2, 17 tells us why God is that way. He says, the world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. God knows these things that you think are so important today, all the fashions, all the styles, all the fads, they're going to pass away. All the lusts that seem so important today, I've got to have, I've got to. No, not really. It's going to pass away. But if you'll just do what God tells you to do, you're going to abide. You're going to go on. You're going to have a life worth living. God wants us focused on things that will last his will and his way. John 15, 13 to 15, Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master's doing, but I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. Jesus said, his friends do what? You're my friends if you do what I tell you to do. Follow me. Do what I tell you to do. But there's a benefit to being a friend of Jesus. He says, I'm going to tell you what the father's telling me. Jesus will let you know things that other people will not know inside. Don't go there. Don't do that. Do this thing over here. Let that go. The Holy Spirit inside you. We'll talk to you and show you things that others who don't know God will not know. So I want to spend a little bit of time tonight looking at some traits of what a good friend is like, and let's see if God qualifies. First of all, a good friend is faithful. A good friend sticks with you. Hebrews 13 verse 5 tells us the very end of it. For he himself has said, I will never desert you nor will I ever forsake you. God said, I'll never desert you. I'll never forsake you. God won't leave you alone. He's a faithful friend. Another thing of a good, another quality of a good friend is they're loyal no matter what. You know, um, say you're, you're working somewhere and you see a group of people talking and some people and then you hear them over here, the, oh, they're criticizing you. But your friend is standing there. And your friend is defending you and they say, oh, they're not that bad. You just, you just don't know them well. Oh, that's really, it's a really good person. Oh, I think you misunderstood something. They're defending you. Your friend is loyal. Doesn't matter what others say. Proverbs 17, 17 tells us a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. You know, a real friend, they don't bail on you, as we would say. 
They don't take off when things are tough. They stick right close to you. Isaiah 43, 2 talks about a really rough time we can go through. It says, God says himself, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. See, no matter what you're going through, it may seem like waters and rivers and fires, but God said, it's okay, I'm here, and I'm not going to leave you alone. Something else a good friend does, they want the best for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. God says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Look at that. God's plans, what are they? Welfare, future, hope. He wants good things for you. Oh, Isaiah forty-eight seventeen tells us, this is the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. Future, hope teaching you to profit, leading you. Isn't that a good friend? That's the way our father is. A real friend, another thing, quality of a good friend, they'll tell you the truth, but they tell you kindly. You know, there's no need in being rude and hurting people's feelings. We don't have to be that way. But if your friend is doing something, let's say your friend is wearing this outfit is kind of outrageous. And you know, people are going to laugh at them and they come and say, how do I look? Hmm, what do you say now? Should I just say, oh, good, good? No, don't do that. That's a lie. They don't look good, do they? But you don't have to say, oh, that's terrible. You look disgusting. No, don't say those kind of things. But you could say it like this. Um, I think you have some other outfits that suit you better. Maybe you might consider wearing something different, you know? You can be gentle, but still tell them the truth. A good friend tells the truth. They'll tell you if you got food stuck in your teeth or your shirt's all twisted up. They'll tell you that. Why? Because they don't want you to be humiliated. They don't want other people to take one look at you and laugh and to put you down. A friend, that's part of protecting you. That's part of loving you is they tell you the truth. That comes out of love. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Rubbing together. Sometimes we got to rub a little bit against the friends and say, you know, my friend, you know, you're great and all, but maybe consider, maybe consider this thing. Maybe that's not best. That's love. Another one, Proverbs 27, 6 says, Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Why would your friend wound you? Well, again, in love carefully. They're telling you, hey, this is not the best for you. This is not the best for you. You know, I'm on your side. This, I'm, you know, I got your back. But if you do that thing, man, it's not going to go well. I can see it already. But an enemy, deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. An enemy will butter you up. They will compliment you. They'll say things that won't try to see you fall, to see you mess up because they don't love you. They're against you. I remember a time, this brief when I was in high school, um, about, probably about 17, I already knew I had a call of God in my life to preach, so I was focusing in that direction. And some girls came up to me one day in school, and they said, you know, we got this friend, and he ended up going to prison, and he's alone. And we think, yeah, you're, you're a Christian. You go to church. Maybe you could, you could encourage him. Maybe you could help him out. Why don't you write him letters? We'll give you his address. Write him some letters encourage him and I thought well yeah I mean maybe maybe I can talk to this guy and he can get saved maybe he can come to know Jesus while he's in jail sounds good so I wrote this guy a couple letters and he answered me too and then one day I was standing in school and I heard these girls talking and they were laughing and they said you know <laughs> that guy's gonna be really shocked when he gets out he thinks there's some nice girl out here waiting for him he's gonna find out that a loser like her it's a loser like her that he won't want anything to do with. And then I realized something. Oh, I knew these girls were my friends, but they basically not only wanted to hurt him, they wanted to hurt me. They wanted to hurt both of us. And so I dropped that letter writing right away. You see, deceitful of all the compliments of a friend. Oh, you could do this. You could do this. Now be careful. Listen, a friend will protect you at all side. 
at all times. A friend protects you and he's on your side. That's what I meant to say. Isaiah 41, verses 10 and 13. Isaiah 41. God says this to us. Do not fear for I'm with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That surely means I'm telling you the truth. God's saying, don't be anxious. Don't be fearful. I'm going to make you strong. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to get you through whatever. I'm right here. Verse 13 as well. For I'm the Lord your God who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear. I will help you. God wants to help us. He's got our back. He's there to protect. He's there to help us. He's on our side. No matter what comes up in your life, that's the kind of God he is. Another thing a good friend does, they defend you when others are there to attack. Isaiah 54, 17 talks about being attacked, especially verbally. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. Every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. God says, I don't care what they say to you. I don't care how much they accuse you. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to straighten it out. I've been listening to the camp meeting services from Rhema this week. They have their, their yearly camp meeting right now, three times a day. And one of the ministers there shared something, an experience he had when he was just a young minister. He said, you know, starting out, it was kind of rough. Um, wasn't going so well. And one day he was driving and these thoughts suddenly started coming at his head. You know what? You're not going to make it. You're a screw up just like your father. And then he remembered, oh yeah, his biological father had actually abandoned them. And he was raised by a stepfather. And he said, my dad really was. He really was. He messed up his life. I know that. But he kept saying, you know that saying, like father, like son? Well, your father messed up and you're a mess up too. Well, he said, right as those thoughts were coming through his head, suddenly he heard that loud authoritative voice of the Holy Spirit. And it said, shut that thinking up right now. Shocked him. He was driving, he said, he pulled over. He was so shocked. Sometimes when the Holy Spirit needs to get your attention, it seems like he's yelling at you. You ever been yelled at by God? I have a couple times. Shut that thinking up right now. Yes, like father, like son, but I'm your father now, and you're my son. And you can do anything I tell you to do, and through my power, you're well able to follow what I tell you. I'm giving you the ability to do the work I called you to do. God spoke those words of encouragement. He did not let Satan's lies stay in his head. Why? He knew if he thought about that, and he believed it, and he took it to heart. It would just make him insecure. It would make him hesitate. It would make him maybe pull back from doing what God called him to do. But today, because that man listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit and not the other voice, which obviously was the devil, we know. Today, he's a successful minister and teaching other people. God was there to protect him from the enemy's lies. Good friend, isn't he? You know what else a good friend does? They rejoice with you when things are going well. Look at Psalm 126, verses 1 to 3. When the Lord brought back the captive ones of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. You notice it says the Lord has done great things for them. So that's somebody on the outside looking in, watching the victory in the life of their friend and say, the Lord's done great things for them. I'm laughing, I'm shouting, I'm happy. That's a friend. A friend rejoices with you when things are going well. God rejoices over us, over our victories. Zephaniah three seventeen. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exalt over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Do you know God actually is joyful? He rejoices. He enjoys his kids. God enjoys his kids. He wants us to do well. He wants us to be happy. That's the way God is. Have you ever 
been going through something, you did something, you know, you just had to do it, even though you're kind of discouraged and you really didn't want to do it anymore. And you kind of heard that voice of God on the inside that said, good job, good job. You did the right thing. That's right. Remember one time that happened to me. Um, when we were in Austria, my husband and I were in music ministry. Um, and we were singing at a larger church gathering. And sometimes people were not always nice. And people thought, you know, if you're married to music minister, then he must float on clouds. Obviously, he's just living off, you know, in the heaven somewhere and not a real person. And of course, you don't face anything in your life. Well, you know, that was not really the case. Um, we went through things like everybody else. But we were very dedicated to that ministry. We spent time praying and preparing and getting ready. And that one day I was feeling a little bit down, a little bit frustrated. But we were there early as we always were, waiting for everybody else to come, setting, making sure everything's ready. And then I just felt like, you know, this I don't know about this. But then I looked over and I saw some of the chairs were kind of messy. Nobody else was there yet, but I thought, I'll just go straight in the chairs. I went over and started straightening up the chairs, which was kind of my way of saying it doesn't matter, God. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter anything else. I'm just going to do what you tell me to do. It don't matter. Nobody knows. Nobody will know that I straightened up the chairs. They're not even here yet, but you know it. So I'm just giving this to you. And I kind of felt on the inside that God was saying, good job. Good job. That's right. You just don't give up. Just Good job. Sometimes God just wants to tell us, good job. Don't give up. Don't stop. Just keep doing what God calls you to do. On one point, a friend will encourage you and will help you go on. God does that for us. I just got a couple verses here, how God encourages us. Hebrews 12 is one. Hebrews 12, one to three. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who's endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. God's saying, there are people who've gone before you, and now they're watching in that cloud of witnesses. And they're saying, keep going. Don't give up. Keep running your race. Remember with Jesus? Jesus did it. It was hard. It was tough on the cross, but he kept going because of the joy set before him. Jesus kept his eyes on what God was going to do. Save us. And God encourages us, just keep running your race. A similar one, Galatians 6, 9. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary. Sometimes we get tired of doing the right thing, don't you? Sometimes it seems like, come on, God, when are you going to do something? But he says, don't get tired of it. In due time, you'll reap. In due time, you're going to see this thing work out. It's going to happen. It's going to be all right with you. One more, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Have God ever called you? Have he ever told you something in your life that he's planning on making it happen? That's why we keep running. That's why we stay faithful and we don't give up. He will bring it to pass. He said he would. God wants to be your friend. I think of an instance in my life when I just kind of learned to follow God's friendship. Um, I told my story before about how, you know, my husband and I were separated when we were still dating and looked like we weren't going to see each other again. And so I was praying, God, you know, you said this is what you want, so make it happen. And praying and praying and believing. And well, guess what? One day he answered my prayer. And it kind of stunned me. Have you ever been in that position where you've been believing God for something so long and then when he does it, you quite don't really know what to do next? Yeah. So I stood there and went, well, shoot. Now he came to see me. Now he wants to, you know, he wants to get to know, wants us to get to know each other. What will I do next? And so I prayed, God, well, well, what now? You know, I put all my energy and all my attention into believing and he would come back and there he was. And so God said, 
okay, if you're going to have, if you're going to build a relationship with this person, then you need to start tearing down those walls around your heart. You know the walls we build around our hearts to protect ourselves so nobody gets too close and nobody can hurt us. He said, start open up some of those walls. Start letting them see who you really are. And so I did that. And step by step, the Lord gave me instructions. And then I remember after we were married, here I was now a young wife, and I'm saying, Lord, I spent my whole life as a single Christian. And I know the rules for being a single Christian, but now what about being a wife? And God said, well, the rules have now changed. The things that were important then are not the same. Now your life is about giving. Your life is about giving yourself. And so I followed his instructions and we built a relationship. But see, I'm saying this because God wanted, to, wanted me to ask him. Sometimes we're too embarrassed to ask God. You ever been that way? God doesn't want us to ever be embarrassed. I mean, it's God. He knows you anyways. He knows your thoughts anyways. Just go ahead and ask him. God, I don't really know how to fix this thing. I can't talk to anybody about this. God, help me with this thing. God says, it's okay. I know. I got your back. I'll show you what to do. So God helped us throughout the years as we pray and come back to him with whatever was going on. And then after 36 years, my husband moved to heaven. He's with Jesus today. And I said, well, Lord, what about now? I mean, you made us a team. You made us one. And now I'm alone again. What do you want me to do? And then God said, okay, let me show you the next step. And he showed me what to do next. You see, God wants to spend our lives together. He wants to go with you from the time you're young through all of your adult years till the day you finally go off to be with him. He's that kind of a friend. He understands you. He knows what you need. He wants to be so much more than your savior. That's important. We all need to be born again, but he wants to be involved in your life. God, the best friend you could ever have. Let's pray together. I thank you, Father. But you not only sent Jesus to die for our sins and to make us yours, and then you didn't leave us alone. Father, I thank you that you're here every day to build a relationship with us, to answer our questions, to lead us, to protect us, to encourage us, to instruct us. Thank you that you're the best friend we can have. Father, if someone here does not know you as their personal friend, I pray you would show them tonight that you're there waiting, just waiting for them to come to, the, to you waiting for them to open their hearts and you'll come in and you'll teach them the way they can let go thank you lord for your great love for us we give you praise for it tonight Amen. thank you for joining us for tonight's service if you are in the akron canton area we welcome you to join us saturday nights at 7 30 p.m if you need prayer contact us at our website or come visit us anytime sunday morning where our pastors will be happy to pray with you for more information or directions visit us at faithvictory.org. Faith Victory Church, growing together in Him.